Hi everyone, thank you all for coming uh, and thank you Laundry for inviting me. My name is Leandro Matsukini and today I'm going to talk about why React Native teams need Android developers. So this talk is based in my experience and I, the thing as I've learned working here. So I'll try to show you why I think it's good to have some Android native expertise in React Native teams or React Native projects. So let's get started. First a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Argentina, but I also have some Italian roots, so that's why you will see me speaking a lot with my hands. And like uh, a year ago, I moved all the way from Argentina to London to join Skyscanner. And since then, I've been working in the React Native Enablement team. So in this team, we are in charge of setting up and maintaining the React Native infrastructure for Skyscanner, so we try to provide our React Native developers with all the set of tooling and support that they need to create React Native features. And also we take care of the React Native performance and stability. So with all that being said, uh, maybe an interesting fact about me is that I am not a React Native developer. And in fact, I had never worked with React, I had never worked with React Native before joining Skyscanner, my whole experience uh, has been as an Android developer. I've been making Android apps for more than, in, than eight years now. So you may be wondering, what is this guy doing in the React Native Enablement Squad? A guy who has no experience with React Native. And let me tell you that I asked myself the same question the day I joined Skyscanner. Uh, I will never forget when in that first day, my manager, and Yoel, I'm looking at you, he's my manager. Uh, I will never forget when my manager told me, you're going to be working in the React Native Enablement Squad. I was not expecting that at all. I'm pretty sure my face must have looked something like this. <laughs> so, yeah, the moment I was really worried, I was really concerned that I wasn't going to be able to make any valuable contributions in a React Native team with my Android uh, native expertise. But luckily for me and for everyone in the team, I turned out to be wrong on being worried. And since then, I've been working almost exclusively on the native side. So that is what this talk is all about. I'm going to try to share with you some examples of this work. But before doing so, I would like to quickly check how many of you have worked or play around with React Native? Yeah, that's expected, not too many people. This is a, an Android meetup, right? <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what React Native is, uh, let's just quickly define it. Um, so React Native is a framework for building mobile apps using only JavaScript and React. And the word only is between quotation marks because you will see in the stock that that's not always the case. Sometimes you need to write some native code. And then one of the main selling points of React Native is that a React Native app is a real mobile app. What they mean with this is that everything that you see in the screen in a React Native app is rendered with real native views. So they are not using WebView or HTML uh, like many other cross-platform frameworks do. So to understand how they do this, let's have a quick look at the React Native architecture. So we have this client side, which is written completely in JavaScript. And this is what we normally use to create features in React Native. Then we have the core and bridge part, which is mostly written in C++. And React Native uses this bridge to, commun to communicate with the native side. We also have some Objective-C and Java code because the Objective-C++ part is used to communicate with iOS side, and then the Java side is used to communicate with the Android side. And then if we go to the native side, this is where the actual implementation for everything is. So all the views and pretty much everything that happens in a React Native app has a native implementation underneath. So there's no magic here. This is how React Native achieves uh, this uh, real mobile app feature. And of course, for this talk, we're going to focus on, on the Android side, and we'll see some examples of things that we can do here. So let's start with the first one, which is React Native performance metrics. So this is the first thing I worked on. And back then, we didn't have any React Native performance metrics. And of course, we want to have the best 
possible performance, but how can we do that if we don't even know how good or bad React Native is performing? So that's why we needed to introduce these metrics, and I'm talking about metrics like React Native startup time. So React Native needs to complete an initialization process, and the screens can only be displayed once the initialization has finished. So that's why we're interested in knowing how long it takes to initialize React Native. It looks something like this. What you see here is the trend line of React Native startup time across the app releases. So you can see it's been dropping, meaning that the startup time is getting faster. Uh, and this is thanks to some uh, work that we have done to improve the performance. Another example is native module setup time. Uh, so I'm going to talk about native modules in detail later on. But for now, let's just say that they are a way of accessing native code from the React Native JavaScript side. And all of these modules need to be set up first. And some of them, uh, for some of them, the setup happens during the React Native initialization. So that's why we want to know how long it takes to set up each module. So what you see here is uh, a list of some of our modules. And it, it's showing how long it takes to complete the setup for each one of them. And you can see, for example, in this case, that localization it's taking a long time. So by using this metric, we know that we can improve, what we can optimize that native module. And then another example is React Native Screens render time. And this is, this is just that, is how long it takes to render every React Native screen in our app. And yeah, we have lots of metrics. I'm just going to quickly mention a few more. Startup delta time. This is our most important metric, and it's defined by the relationship between the native startup process and the React Native startup process. Don't worry if, it, if this doesn't make any sense now, because I'm going to talk about this specific metric later on. But just for now, keep, for now, keep in mind that this is our most important one. Then deep link screen render time. In this case, we want to know how long it takes to render a screen when we are directly deep linking that screen. And then we can do all sort of queries like startup time by, by OS version, by device. We have lots of data and we have a dashboard full of metrics. And the reason why I am mentioning these metrics in this talk is because all of them were implemented in the Android native side. So I will show you part of this implementation. So Let's start with React Market Constants. Uh, this is part of React Native core code, as you can tell by the package name on the top. And React Native provides us with these constants uh, that we can subscribe to to get notified about the different stages of the initialization process. So we have tons of, of them. And for each one of them, we have a start and an end event. So basically, by taking the start time and the end time, we can then just calculate how long it takes to complete every step of the React Native initialization. And then the way we are using them is uh, with this class, which is also part of React Native core. And you see that this is just simple, a simple Java class that contains a list of listeners. And these listeners implement this market listener interface. And this interface contains only one method <coughs> that receives one of the constants we saw before. And then just to subscribe, we call add listener. And to unsubscribe, we call remove listener. So it's pretty simple. It's just basic static uh, Java methods. So this is React Native side. Uh, let's take a look at our end. This is our implementation of the React Native metrics monitor. And this is where we, we are implementing our React Native performance metrics. So everything is implemented in Kotlin. And we have at the top, we have this type alias, which is basically a function that receives a market listener and returns unit. So if you remember these two, this is basically the same thing. These two are receiving a market listener, and they are returning void. So coming back to Kotlin side, uh, the reason we are doing this is because we want to do this. This val is of type React, Mar React Market Listener function, which is our, our type alias. And we are defaulting that one to React Marker .add listener. We are doing the same thing for remove listener. 
And so by doing this, we can basically make this class testable. We can inject uh, a mock implementation uh, in when testing, and we avoid having the static method call inside the class. And then the next thing is that we need to initialize our React Native metrics monitor. So here is where we subscribe to the React Native events and we pass this React Native event listener, which is basically the implementation of the market listener that I showed you before. And then we are delegating to this function where we are using a basic when structure to filter the events we are interested in because we are not logging every part of the React Native initialization. And then for each one of them, we are just using this current time function and saving the time when they are actually happening. And then the last step, we know that after a lot of research, we know that this is the very last step of the React Native initialization. So here is where first we remove the marker listener, so we avoid leaking the, the, the listener. And then for those of you who are Rx Java users, you may have noticed this line. What we are doing here, we are calling on next on the React Native startup finished subject, which is an Rx Java subject. So when I showed you this function, I skipped the first line, which is subscribe app start. Now I told you before that the React Native startup delta metric is our most important, uh, important metric, and that's defined by the relationship between the native startup process and the React Native startup process. So for calculating this metric, we need to know where both processes have finished, and that's what we are using Rx Java for. We have this app launch monitor that uh, exposes an observable which we can subscribe to to receive events about the stages of the native startup process. So it's similar to what we have with React Nat Native Market Constants, but this time for native. And then of all these events, we are interested in this one, which is the one that's fired when the splash screen disappears. So when that happens, we do the same thing, which is save the time, and then we use this zip operator to synchronize the native startup process and the React Native startup process. So when we know that both of them have finished, we just call log metrics and send our measurements to our analytics platforms. And that's it. I skipped some, some parts, uh, but that's pretty much it. It's all implemented in, in Kotlin the native side. And by the way, this is the only way you can do it. You cannot implement React Native performance metrics in the JavaScript side. You need to do it on, on, the, on the native side. So great, now we have our metrics, now we have all the data. It'd be great to do something with that data. It'd be great to start doing some performance improvements. So we've done lots of them, but for this talk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mention a specific one which was completely done on the native side, on the Android native side, and that improved our startup process massively. So in order for you to understand the impact of the change, I'm gonna explain the startup pro how the startup process works and how React Native fits in this process. So let's forget for a second that we have React Native in our app and let's assume that we just have a normal native app. This is what happens when we start the app. We see the splash screen, then we initialize everything that we need to initialize, and then when that, hap when that finishes, we dis disappears the splash screen, and we just show the, the home screen. Now, let's see what happens when we uh, add React Native into the mix. Now we have two parallel processes. The one on the top, that hasn't changed. The app in it has remained the same. But now, alongside with that, we have the React Native initialization. And you can see that even though they are parallel, they don't start at the same time. React Native starts where the, where the red line is. So why is that? So I told you that we are using something called native modules and that these native, native modules get initialized during the React Native startup. And because we are using our own native modules, some of them depend on code that we have, or we have on our native side. And these components that we have on the native side are initialized during that stage. So that's why we can't really start React Native Startup at the same, at the same time. We have a dependency here. And then we have this sole loader part. 
so 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 loader is a, a native code loader that React Native uses um, to load native C++ libraries. This these C++ libraries are packed in uh, files with the SO extension, so that's why the name. And basically, the SO loader grabs these files from the APK and then loads those files uh, into memory. So React Native Core is written in C++ and they also use some third-party C++ libraries. So that's why they, they need to load these libraries in memory first. Uh, so we have two dependencies. We have one dependency with our app initialization process and the other one with the soul loader. But that's fine because we are still starting our app in a native screen, so we can keep initializing React Native on the background, and then probably by the moment the user gets to a React Native screen, this is done and they won't notice anything. But the problem comes when we want to start our app in a React Native screen. Because now when the splash disappears, React Native is not ready yet, and so we have to display this beautiful white screen, uh, and we don't want to do that. So the time that the user spend on this white screen is that what we call the React Native Startup Delta Time. And this is why I told you that this is our most important metric. We want this delta time to be as close to zero as possible, or even better, if we can get it to a negative value, that would mean that React Native is ready when the splash screen disappears. So we have seen that React Native Startup has two dependencies, one with our app initializa initialization and the other one with the soul loader. But what about the soul loader itself? Uh, is the soul loader is just loading some native C++ libraries that are completely independent from everything else. So what if we do this? What if we split the React Native initialization and we break it down in two stages. So we do the soul loader as soon as we start the app and then by the moment we hit the red line that's already done and we, we can start React Native immediately. So it should look something like this. So this should allow us to get a negative start of delta time. So let's see how we can make it possible in the code this is part of our app launch interactor, which is a class that we have in place to, that orchestrates the whole app initialization. So everything that's going on behind the scenes of the splash screen happens in this class. And it's divided in three sequential stages. The first one is start process, the second one is update configuration, and the third one is start app. So each one of these stages executes uh, a series of what we call gateways and each one of these gateways is in charge of initializing a specific component of the app. So you'll see that we are initializing React Native in the last stage because as I told you before we depend on the other on the previous two stages to be completed before. And what we were doing, we were initializing the soul loader inside this gateway so we were first loading the native libraries and then after that launching the React Native initialization. But then we figured that we could split that process and do the soul loader in the first part, which is start process. So now by the moment we get to the startup function, the React Native, uh, the soul loader part is done and we can start the React Native initialization right away. And this is how we achieved the negative startup delta time and this is what our startup looks like now. So for us it's a massive improvement because now when the splash disappears, React Native is already uh, good to go. So this is pretty much about React Native performance improvements. We've done more but for this talk I think this was the most relevant one. So moving on to the next thing which is native modules. I mentioned these before, uh, so let's see what they actually are and how we are using them. So native module is native code that can be used from the React Native side. And what do we use native modules for? We use them when we need to access APIs that are only available on the native platform. So one example of this is when a new version of Android comes out and there's still no implementation on the JavaScript React Native side, then you need to create a native module to expose all, those, all that logic to the JavaScript side. 
Reusing existing native code, this is our most common usage because uh, Skyscanner app is a brownfield or hybrid app, um, which means that we have some parts in React Native, some parts in Native. This happened because originally we, uh, Skyscanner app was uh, only Native. And so when we added React Native, we had already in place a lot of core business logic. So instead of rewriting everything in React Native, we can just reuse that by creating native modules for that. And then the last example is writing some high-performance multi-thread code. Yeah, because in JavaScript we have only the JavaScript thread, so we can really do multi-complex, uh, multi-threaded things in that side. So in our app, we have 24 native modules and counting. We keep on adding more as we need them. And it's, uh, it, that means that we have a lot of native, native code for React Native features. Let's see just one example of this, which is um, uh, in hotel details. This is our hotel details screen. And you can see that uh, we are showing a map. And in this map, we are showing points of interest around the hotel. Now, because this is an Android meetup, I feel like I must warn you that we are going to see some JavaScript code. but that's it, it's only this. Um, so this is the JavaScript side of the native module and the most important bit is this. We are defining a function which receives a latitude and longitude and the number of places that we want to load and display in the map. So then we can call this function from anywhere in JavaScript and get the list of places that we want to show. And then in this line, what we are doing, we are calling the module by its name. So now going to the native side, you will see that it's here where we define the module name. And because we are extending this React Native class, we can override the function, expose this module to the JavaScript side. So React Native takes care of all the magic. Uh, and this is how we make it available to re the React Native side. And similarly, we have the React method annotation. So if we annotate a uh, method with that annotation, we, we are telling React Native to make this function callable from the JavaScript side. And you can see that the whole implementation is in here. It's all uh, uh, RxJava fetching a list of places from some backend and then doing some data transformation that looks really ugly. Uh, but we need to do that because JavaScript needs uh, to receive the data in a specific format. So this is just one example of the native modules, but er each one of them has like 99% of the code of a native module is in the native side. So then just to quickly mention a few more examples of, of things that we, uh, we have implemented on the native side. App navigation, um, so we already had some uh, navigation framework, framework in place before adding React Native. So that's why we created a native module to expose this to the nat to React Native side. And also by doing this, we can provide a seamless uh, navigation experience across all the screens, no matter if they are native or React Native. Uh, so yeah, uh, to provide support for React Native end-to-end -end testing, we are using a framework called Detox. And this framework uh, for Android is built on top of Espresso. So there were some things that were, were not working as expected for us with Detox and we needed to mess with Espresso, idling resources. So basically we needed to, to tweak their code in the native side to make it work for us. And then the last one is upgrading React Native. So upgrading React Native is not usually a straightforward task because things just go broken. And uh, it could be in the JavaScript side, but also on, on the native side. And that's when having some native developers in the teams can be, become handy. For example, when we upgraded to React Native 58, they, they changed the way, they, they, the logic behind the React Native markers that we were using to gather our metrics. And because of that, we lost all of our metrics. So we needed to basically do the fix on the native side, on the native code base, and we ended up making a contribution to the React Native squad, uh, the React Native team, uh, because uh, we needed that uh, for our metrics. So yeah, you can see there's no shortage of examples of things that 
need to be done on native side. So as a recap, let's try to answer th the question that gives the name to desktop. So why do React Native teams need Android apps then? So they need them if we want to implement React Native performance metrics. There's no other way you can do this. You cannot do this on, on, on the JavaScript side. So if you want to have some performance metrics, you need to do it on the native side. Then if they want to get the best React Native performance, yeah, there's so much you can do on the JavaScript side. You can do some minor uh, performance improvements on the rendering of the screens, but that's pretty much it. Then if you really want to get good performance, you need to work a lot on the native side. And then, of course, all of the reasons we saw for using native modules, uh, like accessing APIs that are only available on the native side, or writing multi-threaded code, or reusing existing native code. And maybe this last one is the only one that applies to only uh, brownfield projects. So yeah, you see there's quite a few things uh, that require the expertise of a native uh, developer. And don't get me wrong, you can do pretty cool stuff with React Native without ever touching any native code, but I do think that there's a bunch, a bunch of work that can be done from the native side that can really take React Native apps to the next level. So that's why I think that React Native teams could use some help from native developers to make the, mouse, the most out of this framework. And that's all I have. Thank you very much.